joy and peace. Patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Here we go. These are the fruit of the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. These are the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Again, if you notice on your screen this morning, Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23, they list nine flavors of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we call it flavors because notice it's the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, it's one fruit, nine flavors. One fruit, nine flavors. So the fruit of the Spirit is what's produced in our life as we're walking and living in the Holy Spirit. And these, this fruit is produced in many different flavors. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And you'll find these, as we'll see today, because we're going to look at a lot of scriptures today, uh, we're going to see all of these flavors of this fruit of the Spirit connected to the life of the believers. So today we are going to look at three flavors of fruit. And then after today, we have two flavors left, faithfulness and self-control. So only two weeks left in our series, but today we're going to look at three flavors of the fruit of the Spirit. And those flavors are kindness, goodness, and gentleness. Kindness, goodness, and gentleness. We're looking at three together because they're, these flavors are kind of similar in attitude and action. Uh, they, they carry the same, uh, the same heart and spirit. They're intertwined together, but yet distinct in their own unique ways. We see other scriptures where several of these are tied together, such as in this scripture in Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 12. Scripture says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, that's you, by the way, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, that's you, by the way. He says, because you're God's children, he says, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So we see these flavors uh, mentioned together in several scriptures throughout the New Testament. So we're going to look at these three together, kindness, goodness, and gentleness. And what we're going to do, we're going to take some time and look at each of these individually to find out their own unique individuality as flavors. And then I want to end today showing us three very quick ways of the effects of these three as we go forth this week. So we're going to jump right into these flavors today. The first flavor is kindness. Somebody shout kindness. Kindness. Somebody say be kind. Be kind. Here's what we're going to talk about kindness. Kindness is the outward expression. Kindness is the outward expression of a heart of love and grace. Kindness is the outward expression. Kindness is focused on outwardly. It's focused on other people. When you show kindness, we're obviously showing kindness to somebody else. And so kindness is the expression of love, a heart of love and grace, and it's shown in active charity, active love, a love that gives, a love that sacrifices. That word charity, uh, you know, is found in our King James Bible. It's kind of a more old English word. It's translated love, but charity in itself is a love that gives. It's a love that's selfless. It's a love that sacrifices. So when you give toward a charity, you're, you're, you're sacrificing and you're giving. It's love in action. So we find that this kind of kindness is active charity towards others, and it's driven by compassion. It's driven by compassion. So we can link kindness and compassion together. Kindness and compassion together. When you talk about kindness and think about kindness, kindness is the language of grace. Kindness is the language of grace. What is grace? A simple definition of grace is grace is you doing something kind to somebody else out of the goodness of your heart. That's what grace is. Grace is you doing something kind to somebody else out of the goodness of your heart. Kindness does not have anything to do with the person you're showing kindness to. 
You can show kindness to a person that's not kind to you. Kindness has to do with the giver of kindness, not with the receiver. That's why grace is grace. It's undeserved. It's unearned. It doesn't have to prove its worth. So God gives us grace. God gives us love because even though we don't deserve it. In fact, the biblical definition of grace and kindness is especially geared. You're being kind, especially to someone who's not reciprocating that back or who may not be, quote, worthy or who may not have earned that kindness. That's the heart of grace. It has to do with the giver of grace. And so kindness is the language of grace. You're doing something for somebody else out of the kindness of your heart. Kindness isn't earned, it's freely given. This kindness speaks of God's character. It speaks of God's very nature. In the Old Testament, there's a word that describes God over and over and over and over again. And that is it's the Hebrew word called hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed, but it means loving kindness. And that is one of the chief characteristics of God in the Old Testament, loving kindness. It's kindness uh, along with mercy and patience and faithfulness. And that's the chief characteristic of God. So when we want to look at an example of kindness, we look at God and his expression of the gospel and the expression of God, of Jesus, giving his life for us on the cross while we were still sinners. And so I want us to look at some scriptures today that we're going to put on the screen that talks about kindness and this kindness that's mixed with compassion or that comes is driven by compassion. Notice this in Titus chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And just think about that. When the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared. Now, how or where did the kindness of God appear? It appeared in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the personification of God's kindness. Jesus is the personification of God's love. So when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared in Jesus, he saved us. Again, not because of righteous things that we have done. Because kindness is not dependent on what you do. Kindness always speaks to the heart of the one who's showing kindness. Think about this next scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Paul is telling the church at Ephesus. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another. And do this, he says, by forgiving one another. And then he says, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So the way that God expresses kindness is through forgiveness. And because God has expressed his kindness toward us through forgiveness, because we've been forgiven in Christ, Paul tells the church here, now you be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. Kindness. And you see in this verse how kindness and compassion are linked together as well. Kindness comes from compassion. It's the language of grace. And then Jesus takes it up a notch when he says in Luke chapter 6, verse 35, he says, but love your enemies. We highlighted this verse in the past week or two where Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to them. That, that, that goes into our next flavor. And lend to them without expecting anything back. Again, this type of kindness has nothing to do with those who are receiving it. He says, then your reward will be great and you will be the children of the Most High. You will be the children of God. Because he, God, is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Yes, that's in your Bible. Yes, that is in your Bible, that God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He's 
kind to sinners. You may say, well, you know, I don't know if I agree with that. You know, so them, them, them wicked people out there, they deserve. Just remember at one time, you were the one he's talking about here. I was the one he was talking about here. We were the sinners. We were the lost. We were the ones rebelling against God. We were the ones who were ungrateful and wicked and, and evil and doing things we shouldn't do. And sometimes we still do that. So before we turn around and want God to judge others, and we don't want God to show kindness to them because we don't want to show kindness, just remember we're not innocent either. Either. We needed a savior just like everybody else needs a savior. So he says, when you are like God, you're most like God when you're being kind to those who may not have earned your kindness or deserve your kindness. That's the power of kindness. And this has been demonstrated by God over and over again. Knowing the kindness of God to us enables us to show the kindness of God to others. So kindness, that's kind of the definition of kindness. Let's go to our next one. Our next one is goodness, goodness. Goodness is defined as moral excellence and virtue in action. Moral excellence or virtue in action. And then getting deeper into that definition, goodness is doing what is right for the benefit of others. Even if what they're doing may not be right to you, you're doing right by them. You're being good to them. We can see a theme with these flavors of the spirit. Because if you were like me, you were taught growing up that two wrongs don't make a right. So it doesn't matter if someone's not being right to you. Goodness says, I'm going to do right to them. Because goodness is driven by integrity. If kindness is driven by compassion, goodness is driven by integrity. And goodness, it's, it's being a good person, but it's, it's more than just like being a good person in that you're, you're following the rules or you're trying to, to do good. In the Bible, goodness is really about reflecting the moral excellence and integrity of God himself. Because the foundation is God is good. In what he does, in who he is, God is good. And Jesus came to show us a good father that loves us. So if kindness is the language of grace, goodness is the language of a good father. Goodness is the language of a good father. And it comes from God's character. And it's grounded and driven by integrity. Take a look at these couple of verses that we have on the screen. Romans chapter 12 verse 21 echoes the point. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So again, you're doing right operating from integrity, even if you're not being done right, that doesn't give you a reason to, quote, stoop down to that level or to act contrary. You remember who you are. You are a child of God, and your Father is good, and he does what is right. And so we do the same thing through the Holy Spirit. And then Romans chapter 2, verse 4, says this. And he's reminding, and, and the context here in Romans chapter 2 is in Romans chapter 1, um, Paul issues a condemnation of everybody in the world, all the lost sinners in the world. And so people in the church, people that, that's in religion would say, yeah, Paul, you preach to those sinners out in the world. Yeah, you, you, you get them. You go after them. They, they deserve what they get. And then Paul turns the tables on those who have this religious attitude of we're better than you. He says, you know, because some of you, he says, are doing, you know, you're, you're doing the right things, but in your heart, you have the same attitudes of those that you're condemning. And so here's what he tells to these religious people that think they're better than others in Romans 2, 4. He says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience? Do you despise when you see God, you know, being patient with others or, or being good to those who we may not think deserve it, he says, are you despising or holding contempt for God's kindness 
and God's forbearance and God's patience. Not realizing that God's kindness, or one translation says, not realizing that God's goodness, the goodness of God, is intended to lead you to repentance. He says, don't despise God being good to those who we feel may not deserve it because it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. It's when people see how good God is. It's when people see the, the message of the good news, the gospel, that they respond in repentance to the message. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. So God is good. Think about some of these scriptures in Psalm 38 verse 4 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. God is the very definition of goodness. In fact, Jesus said when he, when somebody came up and said, hey, good master. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? He said, there's only one good and that is God. So he establishes God as the ultimate good in the world. When God created the world, and he created humanity. He looked at it and he said, it's good. The scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. And God through his prophet shown us what is good to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with him. He says this is what good looks like. So goodness in the fruit of the spirit is God's goodness in action to the world around us. Ephesians says that we are his handiwork, created for good works. He made us to do good works, to do good to those in the world. And it's the goodness of God, again, that leads to repentance. Well, how will people know the goodness of God? One way people will know the goodness of God is when they see it in us. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he says, let your light shine before others that they will see your good work and then they will glorify your Father in heaven. So this flavor, the fruit of the Spirit of goodness, it reflects God's moral excellence. It reflects his heart to the people. It reflects his character as a good father. Goodness is the language of a father. Kindness is the language of grace. Kindness is grounded in compassion. Goodness is grounded in integrity. And what about our third flavor of the fruit of the Spirit for today? And it's gentleness. Gentleness can be defined as strength under control. You can still be, you know, we, we put a lot of emphasis on strength and being strong. And you can be strong and gentle at the same time. You know, th thinking about you guys and those babies right there, you know. I, I remember... Uh, almost 19 years ago when I became a dad. Almost 19 years ago. By the way, my baby's turning 16 tomorrow. Yeah. I'm old. That's right. I remember getting that child, and one of my fears before my first child was born is, you know, I was kind of a little nervous to hold her, at least in my mind, because I'm like, oh, I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to squeeze her too hard. I don't want to drop her, you know, because that child is fragile. That child is fragile, and, and I was like, I was holding very close, you know, and like, like holding it like kind of tight but kind of gentle and where it'd be safe, but I wouldn't like squeeze it, you know, or something like that because I'm like, I, I didn't know how. And then, and then the, nurse, the nurse, nurse just takes it and throws it all around like that, and I'm like, okay, well. And then your second kid comes along, and you're like, I'm not going to break it, you know, and then you just toss it all around as well. But you've got to be gentle. Why? Because you're, you're holding something fragile. You know, if you're holding something breakable, what, what does it say on the box when you're holding a box with something breakable in it? It says, handle with care. So it doesn't matter how strong you are. If you have strongness with no, if you have strength with no restraint, then you can take something that's fragile and you can break it and you can crush it. So when you're dealing with something fragile, the quality that you want to have is gentleness. It's strength under control. So it's not a matter how strong you are, it's can you handle something gently? Can you handle something with care? So diving down in gentleness is it's being considerate of others, showing care and tenderness without harshness. And it's driven by humility. Gentleness 
comes from humility. And I put it here as gentleness is the language of Jesus. Gentleness is the language of Jesus because Jesus is the ultimate example of humility. Think about it this way. The the one who created the world came into the world and made himself subject to the things of this world, to the hurt of this world, to the pain of this world, to the suffering of this world. He was greater than the world, but he came into the world humble and gentle and lowly. He was a king, but he didn't come with a mighty army. He came riding on a, on a donkey, a meek and lowly animal. Gentleness is the language of Jesus. It's driven by humility, where kindness is driven by compassion and Goodness is driven by integrity. Gentleness is driven by humility. Where kindness is the language of grace, goodness is the language of the Father, gentleness is the language of Jesus. And so handling with care, being gentle. You know, there's really no greater area when you think about it than when dealing with people. Because again, gentleness here in the fruit of the Spirit is expressed toward others expressed toward other people. And some people it's hard to be gentle with. Let's just be honest. You know, some people we've been harsh with. Some some, some people we've tried to show our strength to in negative ways. But if you think about it, people are fragile as well. Even the people that that we would, in our human flesh, would want to respond harshly to or mean to or, or angry to. One thing that I've had to remind myself all of my life is that when you find people that are constantly hurting other people, it's because they were hurt. When you find people who are breaking other people, it's because they've been broken. And we never know what people are going through in their life when people lash out at others, or they're always angry, they're always criticizing, or they're quick-tempered, or there's usually means there's something deeper going on. Gentleness de-escalates the situation. It doesn't respond in harshness in order to ignite the flame. And that's what I love about Jesus. Jesus dealt with people, especially broken people. He dealt with them with gentleness. He dealt with them with care. Even people that, that the Pharisees, the religious in Israel, that they would be harsh with, Jesus was gentle with. And that is the strength of Jesus. That's what makes Jesus unique. So think about some of these scriptures in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 29. Here's what Jesus says. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I've got something to teach you, Jesus says. He says, so watch me, walk with me, learn from me. Learn from me because I am gentle and humble. There's the connection between those two. I am gentle and humble in heart. That's who Jesus is. That's why gentleness is the language of Jesus. He says, I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He says, so learn from me. Learn from me how to look at people. Learn from me how to show compassion. Learn from me how to minister to the broken. Learn from me how to minister to those who who society and, and even the church has cast out. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. Then we see in Ephesians chapter four, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus again. And he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of your calling. What's our calling? Our calling is to be conformed to the image of Christ. Our calling is to be like Jesus. So how do we live a life worthy of being like Jesus? He says, be completely humble and gentle. Those two connected together. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. He says, if you want to be like Jesus... You want to live up to your calling as a Christian, here's how you do it, humble and gentle. 
In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, he tells the Galatian church on how to deal with people that fall into a certain sin. He said, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, he doesn't say kick them when they're down. He doesn't say condemn them even more. He doesn't say look at them and say, I told you so. I knew this would happen. You must not be saved. You must not be a good Christian. That's not what he says. He says, if someone is called in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Should restore that person gently. And he says that because to watch for yourselves lest you also be tempted. He says, so when someone falls in a sin, have a humble attitude. Don't have a I told you attitude or I can't believe you or if you were a good Christian or if you would have just done this more or if you were more like me. He says, because when you have that attitude, you better watch out because the same thing can happen to you. Because every one of us have the ability to fall into a sin like that. Every one of us have the ability to mess up. Every one of us have the ability to do that. He says, so when you see somebody else has done that, approach them and restore them gently. Why? Because you need to handle something fragile with care. And then he tells Timothy, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, the Lord's servant. Now he's speaking to leaders here. Timothy was a leader. He's talking to leaders. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. He says to him, opponents or people that would oppose Timothy. Opponents must be gently instructed or better, gently corrected. When you're correcting someone or putting someone in their place. He says to this leader, do it gently. When you have to correct, do it gently. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. So when you think about kindness, kindness is the language of grace. Kindness is driven by compassion. When you think about Goodness. Goodness is the language of a father. It's driven by integrity. When you think about gentleness, gentleness is the language of Jesus. It's driven by humility. Now, I know those are not a lot of qualities that the world system says is good to have if you want to be successful in the world. You know, if you want to climb the ladder, if you want to be successful, if you want to get ahead, if you want to make the most sales, you want to make the most money, you have to be ruthless and you need to be cutthroat and you have to do all of these things. So these principles of the fruit of the Spirit, they are countercultural to the way the world says we should be successful. But remember, Christian, remember, Christian, I know we're in the world, but we're not of the world. It's better to be blessed in the eyes of God than successful in the eyes of the world. And to be blessed in the eyes of God is to be kind and good and gentle, even when it would be, especially when it would be easy to respond by being unkind and harsh and thinking, showing that we're better. So these are the flavors of the fruit of the Spirit. They're the characteristics of God. They're the characteristics of Christ. These qualities are, speak to us as givers. That we should freely and indiscriminately give these flavors to people. Because that's what God would do. Now very quickly, I just want to list, we're not going to talk about these, but I want to list three ways that we can display these in our lives this week. First of all, we show kindness and goodness and gentleness by our deeds. We show kindness and goodness and gentleness by our deeds. James reminds us that faith without works is dead. A faith that doesn't do good works is a faith that's no good. That faith will express itself in works. We show the world our kindness, goodness, and gentleness by our deeds. Number two, we share kindness, goodness, and gentleness with our words. 
So this week, I want us to be mindful of, of what we do, our actions, how we respond to people, how we respond in situations, and our deeds, I want us to think. Before we speak in our words, I want us to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to help us speak words of kindness and goodness and gentleness because we share these flavors with our words. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath and anger. Proverbs 16.24 says, Gracious words are a honeycomb. They are sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. With our tongue, we can build up. With our tongue, we can tear down. Our words can give life. Our words speak death the power of our words. So we share kindness and goodness and gentleness with our words. And then number three, we sow kindness and goodness and gentleness from our heart. That's where these things originate from. A heart that's been transformed and that's being transformed by the Holy Spirit. It starts in the heart. It's being kind and good and gentle. Listen, for the right reasons. There, there's a word that that we used to use, I don't know if the kids use it today, but we used to, a phrase called buttering somebody up. Y'all remember that phrase? So if you want to go out and stay out an extra hour late on Friday night, you would butter your parents up. Mom, you look really good today. You know, Mom, you've done a good job cleaning the house this week. And, you know, you'd butter them up and you'd be kind and you would show appreciation and you would give compliments, but you're doing it so you can get something from it. You know, that's called buttering it up. And so we would butter up our parents or butter up our teachers so we, they'd bump up our grade. So this shows us it's not just what we do. It's not just being kind and good and gentle, but it's also why we do it. It's the motive behind it because you can do the right things for the wrong reasons. And so as Christians, our goal should be doing the right things for the right reasons. And the right reason comes from sowing kindness, goodness, and gentleness from our heart. So our prayer, as we close and our praise team comes back up, our prayer, because none of us are perfect in any of these areas. I don't say any of this to condemn us by thinking we're not perfect because we're not perfect. But to say that the one who is perfect lives on the inside of us and is there to help us. That's why the Holy Spirit is called to help us. So our prayer can be, Lord, help me to show kindness in a situation this week that I could easily respond differently. Lord, help me to be good to somebody, even if they're not good to me back. Lord, help me to be gentle with people this week instead of being harsh and cruel. Recognize those areas that we need the Holy Spirit to help us in and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. Say, Holy Spirit, continue to change my heart. Continue to, to make me more like Jesus. And he's faithful to do it.